Hey folks, how you doing? Robbie O'Brien here from O'Brien Guitars and welcome aboard. Looks like we got people from all over again. And let's just do a quick little roll call here. Thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate this. We've got uh, Rob out there in Spokane, Peter in Colorado, Mo all the way from the UK. Welcome aboard, Mo. Uh, greetings from Corning, New York. Thank you, Robbie and Drew for the informational live streams and replays. Got Westminster, Colorado, Windsor, Ontario. Lucky B, Merry Merry, and Happy Happy, Mr. O'Brien. Thank you. Appreciate that. Acoustic Coyote. Hello, you guys from Iowa and Cosby, Tennessee. That's Elaine. Hey, Elaine, how you doing? Good to see you. And let's see, Colorado Springs. We got Matt. We got uh, Rochester, New York, and Longmont, Colorado, Chicago. Looks like we got a full house. Uh, St. Louis just checked in. Look at that. Well, thanks for tuning in. How's uh, how's the audio? Everything okay with the audio? If, uh, if we've got any issues there, please let me know because I'm not monitoring that off the uh, off the uh, software here. So if we have any issues with uh, with audio or video, please let me know. My wife is off camera here in front of me. She's going to help us monitor the chat box as well. Got a few more people checking in. Stevenson's Ranch, California. And hello from Sky Tinted Waters. Where is Sky Tinted Waters? Hi from sunny San Diego. Hello from France. Whoa, all the way from France. Raymond, welcome. Welcome aboard. It's probably pretty late at night over there for you. All right. Everything sounds good. Perfect. Well, let's go ahead and get going here. Uh, we've got a good show for you already tonight. Uh, Drew Boyd is going to be joining us, and I'll introduce him here in just a second. But let me just uh, direct you over to my website here real quick, and let's see if I can make this thing work. Look at that. It worked. This is my website. The reason why I'm pulling up my website is because uh, there's a 10% off sale right now, all the way through Christmas today, and so I want you guys to to be able to check out the 10% uh, off there. you got to use the promo code O'BrienXmas. All of my online courses are on sale, including the marketing from uh, from Drew Boyd, Marketing for Luthiers, and Drew's going to be joining us here in just a few minutes, and so have all your questions ready there, uh, but even his course is on sale, and let's see what else we got here. Uh, we got a couple of announcements. The Leveling, Wet Sanding, and Buffing Made Simple course by Jeff Jewett will be coming out soon. Hopefully in the January, the first part of February, I can get that out and running. But there's a lot of stuff going on at the O'Brien Guitars website. In fact, if you want to watch past live streams, Shop Talk live streams that I've done here, if you just go right up here to the Media tab and come down and click on the Videos, and then there's a drop-down menu. And you'll notice that there's all my Luthier Tips Du Jour videos there. And if you hit that drop down menu there, you can scroll down and look at that. One of the items is live streams. And so if you just click on that, then you got all of the uh, all the live streams there. Even our most recent one that was with Drew Boyd, who's going to be our guest uh, a speaker here in just a minute. And he was here in my shop recently. We uh, we built a guitar together. Speaking of Drew Boyd, let's hustle on over to his website real quick. There's the man himself, Drew Boyd, and he is going to be joining us here in just a second. But let me uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Drew. Drew is uh, he's a, a well-known marketing guru. Does travels all over the world. He's got three uh, books that he's authored: uh, "Adding Prestige to Your Portfolio," uh, "Be a Professor," and "Inside the Box." He also has a podcast that he does, uh, "Innovation Inside the Box." Um, he also have a, a blog that he does on creativity, which is fantastic. Um, a bunch of videos on the LinkedIn learning uh, series uh, about marketing and creativity. He's also a professor of marketing at the University of Cincinnati. So take a trip over to his website, drewboyd.com, and check him out. And I'm going to see if I can pull him up here. Let's see. Look at that. There he is. Hey, Drew, how you doing? Good. Good Glad you, you can make it. And uh, I'm going I'm to pull up the chat box here. Give me just a second to do that, because I think we probably are going to get a lot of uh, a lot of questions coming in. We also have more people joining here. I can't see how many people are online. Are there any, can you see that? 39 people. Man, 39 people need to get a life, huh, Drew? Yeah. <laughs> so we've got the lane. We already talked about her from uh, from Tennessee. We've got Rochester. We've got Longmont, Colorado, Chicago, St. Louis, uh, California. Sky Tinted Waters, uh, I still don't know where that is. San Diego, France, audio sounds good. We got uh, Henry from Atlanta, Cliff in uh, Davis, California, 
William in Minnesota, Slovenia. We got somebody on here from Slo Slovenia. Cool. Uh, Jose Pereira from uh, Brazil. And my wife, oh, Deanna O'Brien. Look at that. Hey, everybody, and thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Drew, for joining us. Uh, do you have your cup of coffee ready to go there? I do. Fantastic. I do. These uh, shop talks always go a lot better with a, with a good cup of Brazilian coffee ready to go. So let's go ahead and get right into it. And the, the reason why I have put this together, and Drew has graciously uh, uh, accepted my invitation to come on and do the shop talk here, is that most luthiers, you know, we do this because we love it. We're, uh, we're, we're artists. You know, we're not business people. We're not marketing people. And after a while, we start collecting a lot of guitars. <laughs> they start, you know, being put under the bed and on the sofa and in the closets and stuff. So in, in, in just a, you know, layman's terms, simplest terms here, Drew, uh, what is marketing? And break it down for us luthiers. How can we benefit from marketing? Okay. Uh, great, great place to start. And, um, you know, I want to encourage people to certainly fire over the specific questions you have. And um, I also want to uh, tell people, Robbie, we're going to go ahead and give a uh, a free course download. We're going to have a, um, a contest at the end of this with one trivia question. So um, pay attention closely to this first part because it could help you uh, win the, um, the, the free download of my uh, Marketing for Luther's course. But, you know, the, the reason I did that is Robbie's right. So many, so many people, including me, you know, we, we start to think about our involvement in Luther and, and what are we really trying to do? Um, it's great, you know, it's so much fun building guitars, but do you, can you make a go of it? And so that was the point of the course. Um, and, you know, I think I think probably the the big a couple biggest misunderstanding about marketing in general is this: the secret to, for you is to think about what part of your guitar is the very best part of everything else you do. So, if you build necks better than everything else, you think it's the best part of your guitar, or bracing, or uh, design or rosettes or uh, modal tuning. I don't care what it is. Whatever it is you do your very best, your goal in marketing is to make that important. You're going you're gonna to speak in your promotional websites and you know, other things. You've got to draw attention to the single thing that you do the very best in guitar making and, and hype that. And then what happens is you know, if, if if you continue to make that important, that's all marketing is. We make something important that we do well. And I don't care if you're Procter & Gamble. I don't care if you're Apple Apple or Coke. Um, that's what they do. They make, in, they make something important that they do particularly well. You have to do that too as a guitar maker. Um, and so in the course, I talk about, you know, finding what it is you really can claim as your value proposition you know, your one single idea and you get one shot at it, you know, <laughs> um, that's, that's really what marketing is taking that one shot. This is what I do the best. And if somebody out there is, you know, agrees with you on that and also is like-minded, they're, they're going to be a potential customer for you. So Drew, I got There's a quick a question for it. you then. Yeah. Uh, somebody once told me that you should become good at what you do, no matter what it is in life. You know, sanitation yeah. worker, engineer, luthier, whatever. You yeah. should become good at your craft. All and right. then people will seek out your services. So luthiers, should they be thinking along those lines right from the beginning? Should they be thinking marketing business or should they be thinking developing their craft? Well, it, you know, I, I think I think it depends on, on an individual's ambition. And so I talk about... In the course, I talk a little bit about, you know, the first thing you should do is really just get clear with yourself. Like, what am I in this for? How many instruments do I think I can make a year? Um, do I want to scale up with, you know, adding staff, adding other junior luthiers to your team? What What is your annual output? Because that that kind of that kind of speaks then to your marketing problem, how big of a problem you have or right. opportunity. Right. Um, and along with that, though, if you if you know if you want to be competitive in the market be good at at least one thing about guitar making. I mean, make a decent guitar, but 
try to excel at the one thing that just, you know, it really defines kind of who you are, you know, what, and, and it doesn't matter what it is, but don't try to sell something out in the market that's not tied to that one thing that you do really well. And in marketing, we call it the core competency. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I look at my own guitar making skills. I mean, it, it, it's all, Robbie knows he's, it's all over the map in terms of some things I do really well and some things, you know, I'm, I'm still on the learning curve. So like I'm going to emphasize, yeah, like, you know, we're learning all the time. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's really, um, this is really true. It's a lifelong thing. Otherwise, you know, you, you probably ought to think about getting out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I would answer the question that way, you know, okay. just, you got to perfect the one thing that you think you're amazing at and build that. And that becomes the core of your marketing message that you take out into your website and your other marketing uh, programs. Uh, a question came in here from Acoustic Coyote. Um, he says, hello, Drew. What? And I'm going to have to read these questions to Drew because Drew's not monitoring this. I'm trying to monitor here. I got my wife also off camera uh, monitoring her. Uh, she's also known as Miss Brazil or the girl from Ipanema. Many of you have <laughs> met her here in the shop. Uh, Acoustic Coyote. Hello, Drew. What's the best way to find out if a brand name is already being used? Well, it's... Uh, uh, you know, a brand name, um, you, you want to avoid something, definitely want to avoid something that's already being used. But that is that is far short of, of the, like, not the first question you be, should be thinking about. Okay. You should re- really be thinking about, and this is this is the classic mistake of not just guitar makers, but small business people in general. You're people starting out, entrepreneurs make this mistake all the time. They get enamored with the brand, the logo, and all the things you know, all the grandeur of, of what it's about. And I, I'd encourage you to don't even think about who else has that brand yet until you, until you know what you're about. Um, and because you really have two choices in Lou 3 you're either going to make your guitars carry your name, or you're going to make your guitars carry a name that speaks to that one thing you do extremely well. Okay. And, and it's, or both, you know, there, there might be some room for both, but, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, now, if you're going to use some brand that is, you know, like if you're going to call yourself Taylor Guitars, you probably are going to run into problems with right. the guys out in California. Right. Um, but typically just Google searches um, is going to be g- good enough. Um, I recently trademarked uh, something that I'm doing in Lou3 because I want to I want to protect it. But the bigger issue becomes getting your brand and then reserving the website a URL address. Okay. That's probably more important. <laughs> let's say you decide to call your uh, brand. I'll just make this up. I, I, I was listening to on the radio. Unicorn Guitars. Okay. Um, it, it's just something I heard on the radio just a little while ago. If you decide to call your brand Unicorn Guitars, you want to get on Google domains or something right now and reserve unicornguitars.com right because that url address becomes a real centerpiece of your of your brand um but again get 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 clear on the brand on those two options it's going to be your name which good you know that's that's certainly fine that's what i have on my guitars but that's not the only option or come up with a name that's completely tied to that one great thing that you're going to do with your guitars. Um, and, and it's a mis- com- most common mistake in business is people don't give it a literal name to their business. Um, I was I was out the other day and I I, uh, I saw a truck that said, Bugs or Us. <laughs> <laughs> Bugs or Us. It's right. an exterminator, right? right. And, Boy, you, you can I I have a tough time thinking of a better brand name than that. Bugs or Us. It's right. just so clear. To, to what they're all about, right. um, and and I have a whole uh, course in um, on, on online about naming a brand, but um, think think most importantly about what you do very well. Start right. there. Um, the name the name brings up something interesting. Uh, you know, most people call their, their guitars, you know, Boyd guitars or O'Brien guitars. We, we use our yeah. name. Uh, I had a, a person one time tell me, says, why do you, why do you do that? Because you, now you have something that without you, let's say if you're removed from the equation, you have something, you don't have an asset, you have nothing. Now, if you named it, 
you know, Colorado guitars or, you know, Cincinnati guitars, something like that. If right. you're out of the equation, you have a tangible asset that perhaps yes. has some value to it. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, I completely agree. And I had this discussion with uh, um, the, you know, uh, another luthier besides Robbie that I've done a lot of training with, Sergey de Jong up in Canada. And I turned, told Sergey this and his wife, I said, you know, you, when, when you retire and he's getting up there, you know, he's over 70 now. And mm -hmm. when he retires, he has his daughter that's carrying on uh, the young Dijon guitars, Yoshia. She was just featured in an acoustic guitar magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you're right. I would, I would encourage you to think about a guitar brand that is, could be a sellable asset. I mean, you, you could sell it to a young luthier, all your equipment, your shop, your your brand name, your mailing list, you know, your your marketing assets, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and and that's a that's a really that's a really viable way to go. Um, uh, yeah. Rob McAllister put it here in the chat box. He says I can't use my name as a brand; it's already in use. <laughs> so he chose Scorpio because the symbol is an M, and I'm a Scorpio, and it seems to me it seems to be a name that people like based on friends. What are your thoughts? Did you understand that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm, that that's good. I mean, don't don't um, don't overthink it, right? I think it's I think it's um, the 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 best single approach you're going to come up with with a brand and brand name and a logo and everything. Remember, remember what a brand is. Here's another very common misconception: a brand is not your logo. Like here's here's a headstock. These are headstocks that I had made from uh, Gurian. Uh, instruments out in California, mm -hmm. and they did a great job. I had a designer do this, but I put a lot of thought into uh, what my basic brand is before I I went to this. A brand is the is the promise you're making of something great about your guitar. Here I go again. You know, it's about that one single thing you do well, um, right. and you and you want to build a brand around that promise, and and um, and ultimately that's what that's what. Uh, gives you the, the best brand name mm -hmm. where it's, a, then you give, create a logo, create a name. Now a name like uh, Scorp, Scorpio or Scorpion guitars or unicorn guitars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, they, they, the, the, the other thing then is you try to come up with the name of a guitar brand that relates to more to the player's lifestyle. What are you about? Are you about blues? Are you about finger, finger style? Are you more about, um, rock you know what are, what is your sort of your demographic of who you're going after mm -hmm. you could name your brand that's more aligned to the type of customer that you think is going to be the right fit for your guitars right uh, a couple of comments along the same line here uh, larry athen uh, i believe he's in alabama historically classical guitar builders just use their name like santos hernandez they don't name it hernandez guitars uh, yeah that makes sense that makes sense that yeah. way if you want to branch out and make t-shirts and tennis shoes you can right <laughs> You know, it, and that's an old tradition of the of the mass, you know, the the master guitar makers in Europe. And um, sure, you know, that's that's perfectly appropriate. You could be just a boutique seller, where you're going to make a just a handful of guitars in your lifetime. You know, some some number. Mm -hmm. um, and and I encourage you to really sit down and get clear with that. You know, and you look at your how much time you're going to be doing this, how many guitars you make per year. Right. Go, okay, that's that's sort of my output. And, and what is that legacy you want to uh, leave in terms of guitars that ultimately end up in players' uh, hands? Right. Uh, Mo over in the UK, how do you market earlier guitars, which you know are far from perfect, in a way that doesn't damage your brand later as quality improves? That is a fantastic question, Mo. It is. A it lot is. of people it's say that those guitars come back to haunt you. So that yeah, let's yeah. see what you have to say about that, Drew. No, I think I think that's the answer. They, My first guitar... Uh, <laughs> And and I uh, um, I call it Frankenstein. Um, it's sitting up here in my shop, uh, and I have it just kind of re as a reminder to of all the mistakes I made in the binding. And you know, it's terrible. It's just right. a terrible guitar. I, I would never say it I, or sell it. I would never play it. Right. But it's a it's a reminder. Now, if you have um, de fairly decent guitars that you um, want want to sell my, my recommendation is is do we sell them off brand in other words don't sell them as under your brands just sell it as a guitar you know kind of a 
I made this kind oh, of. Oh, that's like an a, interesting idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you see brands go off label, you know, off brand mm -hmm. all the time. They, they want to, um, uh, get rid of the merchandise mm -hmm. and they usually you discount it. Right. Um, and, and now be careful about pricing. This is a big part of the course marketing for Luther's. There's a whole section about pricing mm -hmm. and you want to be careful that you use pricing to, to, to create a reference point for your branded guitars, which you want to hold up as more valuable. So sell, right. sell some of this inventory that you have and, and um, move it out. But if it's got flaws in it, make sure that people know about it. Um, and and I'm I'm starting to look at this. You know, there's guitars now that I've I've have or, and I may I may take parts out of them or I may use them for repair practice. In other words, right. they're in the inventory, but I know I'm never going to sell them or, or right. want to sell them for the very reason I don't want anything out there with my name on it that that doesn't meet a standard. Yeah, that has come back to haunt a lot of people. In fact, I've got a sure little story about that when I was teaching at the college here in Colorado. Somehow I got on a, a an ex NFL football player's mailing list for his charity. And every year I would donate a guitar to this charity and, <laughs> and and that actually worked out to my benefit because that's a great way because, you know, you, they have meet and greet with the artist and that kind of stuff. So you get a little mileage out of it as well. But anyway, yep. one of the very, very early guitars that I ever made got donated to this charity and years went by. And then a few years ago, I get a call from somebody say, hey, I have guitar number such and such, and I'd like to bring it by for a setup. And I looked it up, and sure enough, it was one of those early guitars. And the guy had bought it at the charity. He brought it in with the original strings on it. This thing's about 10 years old by now. Original strings. And, I mean, it was just a mess. It was atrocious. I mean, the bridge was a brick. I mean, oh, my God. I was embarrassed. And I was going to do a setup for 100 bucks on it. As soon as he left out of the shop, boy, I tore that guitar apart. <laughs> I probably did two thousand dollars worth of work on that guitar, put it back together, made it more presentable because it's going back into into the world with my name on it. And that was one of those early guitars that came back to haunt me. So you got to be yeah. extremely careful with stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Go out with your A game. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. And that and sometimes that takes a long time. I mean, they, I mean, building guitars is you know, yeah, it's not easy to to right. get a perfect guitar. So, you know, take your time, do it right, folks. Let's see if we got another question here. Um, we got more people showing up. We got uh, Michael from Winter Haven, Florida. Good. Josh Jacobs. Here we go. Marketing folks. I work with often talk of the four P's of marketing, product, pricing, promotion, and place. Is one the most important in Luthery or all the same importance? Good question. So in marketing, we talk about how the four P's, the, the classic four P's. It's a it's an age old idea, still still very relevant today. All right. The, the product is is the guitar. The pricing is what you charge for it. Place is where you distribute it, and um, uh, promotion is how you talk about it. Typically, in any industry, we one of those P's will be the sort of the dominant the dominant player. Um, you know, in guitar making it's it's certainly not price that's not the lead um it it in the in the high volume producers i would tell you that it's all about distribution oh. you know taylor guitars is pumping out guitars like crazy yeah. right so yeah. they they're trying to the chinese yamaha you know all those chi guitars coming in it's all about distribution right. but for you the independent luther I, I would say it goes to the product you want the most amazing build the most amazing guitar you're capable of uh, that that becomes cent the centerpiece because promotion is going to boil down to just you know a couple of key things your your website um, any shows that you participate in mm -hmm. or any other type of events that you participate in they're going to carry that that single-minded value proposition but if you know if you start with a crappy guitar if you you know you walk in with Frankenstein forget it it's over yeah um, um, and just keep right on walking out the other back door of the show then right yeah. So, so it's a great question. Um, you, you can promote, you can be a great at promotion and there are some, some luthiers out there that are great at promotion, but I haven't found anybody yet that's promoting crappy guitars or just mediocre guitars. Uh, the big factory shops, you know, the, um, Loudon or, 
Seagull, you know, they're they're decent guitar. You know, they're they're good playable guitars, but they're they're it's really all about promotion and distribution. Where up for independent luthiers, it's really about the product. We make a handmade product that is built uh, to not overbuilt like like factory guitars, and that's something we should be very proud of. But but let's you know let's all agree we got to build a good guitar to. to you know, the best we're capable of. Right, right. Uh, Todd Martin has a, a question. He says, who is the largest buying group for classical guitars? Is it college students? That's a pretty good question. Yeah. Uh, you know, for classical guitars, um, I, you know, the, 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 I don't know. Let me just come up, you know, fess up. I, I really don't know. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not so sure I'd go there. Um, because it's it could be a very small population. Yep. Uh, the biggest the biggest buyer is probably the collector. You know, the acoustic player that just likes multiple guitars and wants to have different um, models around. Um, right. And and I, you know, we but Robbie, I mean, we just had a, a college student come to his shop while I was out there to, to do a repair. And you know, yeah. we have a big college of music here at. Um, University of Cincinnati, where I teach, and the dean at the College of Music plays a, a classical guitar. I, I happen to know he has it in his office, but I don't. I don't think that's the right answer. But it's not. I guess the question is, why are you asking? If it's to sell them instruments, good, yeah, I, I like the idea. Yeah, my you know, my personal a, experience is target. And my personal experience has been that it's an outlet for for brand and name recognition, not necessarily yeah. an outlet for guitars. Now, I'll go to the university here, the local university, and I'll give, yeah. uh, you know, demonstrations and talk about instruments and stuff like yeah. that. Um, very seldom will uh, a student come in and ask to buy one of my guitars. Now, they usually already have guitars, and they're in the you know, yeah. master's program or the doctorate program or something, and they already have their instruments. But I do a good amount of repair work through the colleges. Yeah. So if you're into repair work, yeah. and that's usually what keeps the lights that on. Then that's yeah. an excellent source, but for an, right. for a source for selling, I uh, wouldn't count on it. Okay. Yeah, you're right. I mean, a college kid, right? They're they're probably not humidifying it the right way. They're banging it around. It's in their dorm. And yeah, just to, just <laughs> in the, when you were here, I came in one or two people, and since you've left, I've had one or two more people come in that you know have yeah. guitars with cracks and stuff in them. Yeah. Uh, let's run on down the list here. Let's see what we got here. Uh, Elaine says, I think Gallagher, guitar, Gallagher Guitars in War Trace, Tennessee just sold their brand and shop equipment and designs. It keeps the guitar doing and is a great start for someone else. Good idea, Drew. So that's back to that idea of, you know, rather than using your name, create a brand or an asset. Yeah. And then you can you have a tangible asset you can sell. So, yeah, that's yeah. good information. Elaine. You know, you think about guitar makers at um, Collings or Taylor or... Paul Reed, um, Paul Reed Smith. I mean, th these young young guy, guys and gals eventually want to strike out on their own. And imagine being able to go in and buy a shop and, and all the tools and everything else and the brand. But don't forget, it's not just the shop tools and inventory and brand. It's the, your your it's your marketing assets. Um, you know, it's your mailing list. If 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 you really want to do yourself a favor, start building your newsletter mailing list and, and, and communicate with your mailing list. Just have a simple link on your website that allows people to sign up for a newsletter. Once a quarter, you put out a picture of a guitar made. Hey, that's, that's enough. Um, it, it, you know, it, again, it starts with how big of a sales problem, marketing problem do you have? Are you talking 10 guitars a year, one guitar a year, 100 guitars a year? What What is your output? The bigger the, the, the inventory, the more aggressive you need to get to be in marketing. Right. Um, that newsletter idea that you just mentioned, Drew, I, I, I'm a big fan of newsletters, and probably most of the people on the chat here are from my yeah. newsletter group. I have found that to be an excellent source uh, for, for marketing, uh, brand recognition, yeah. you know, Hey, I just got a new video. In fact, they probably found out about this shop talk through my newsletter. So you guys create a newsletter. I, I highly encourage you to do that. It, it creates some trust and some communication between you, the builder and future clients. So you never know the seed that's been going to be planted there. Uh, I found it's been great. Josh Jacobs has a question here. He says, marketing folks, I work. Oh, we already did that one. Sorry about that, Josh. Come on on down. Oh, Josh, we've got another one, man. Oh, Josh. He's getting his money's worth here, huh? <laughs> How important is use slash endorsement by a musician or artist? Any tips on making those connections when located 
in more rural area without a large music scene? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I've, I did a lot of research on that because I early on in my um, guitar making and learning Luthery, I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to get I'm going to get some up and coming star. And the, the, the challenge you're going to face there is they're going to want a free guitar. Yep. And you're going to give them a free guitar and they're going to they're going to it's free. So therefore, it's worthless to them. That's right. Yep. <laughs> it's you know it's worth it's it really is worth it. it could be a beautiful guitar and they're gonna wow look at this i got yep. this for free yep. but they're not gonna take care of it they don't you know they they and i that's kind of harsh but just understand that um I, I don't put as much emphasis on that maybe um you look at a guy like uh olsen guitars you know makes great guitars james taylor was was legendary you know he's still you go to olson's site right now and and he builds great guitars and and james taylor loves them and plays them great that put him but on the I, map too didn't it? it put him it put him on the map it put everybody on the map and, yeah um so it's a it's a low yield it's a high payoff but low yield low probability event that you're going to find the right star if you do you're going to be you're going to be giving them free guitars they're yep. going to come back cracked. They're going to, you know, it's just yep. now if you if you find somebody that you you really believe in their music number one, and you believe in their career, you know, they're good good, just just good people. You like their agent, you know, their manager, <laughs> and they they want an endorsement and they're willing to really step up to it. Um, uh, that's you know then then it's it's it's, it's discussable. But the minute you give away a, free, away a free guitar, that guitar is worth not worth anything. Yeah, I've got a couple of stories about that too. Um, a, a very well known friend of mine or a builder, uh, well known builder uh, happens to be a friend of mine, uh, was approached by a, a pretty reputable player, and gave them the guitar, and about six months later they found it on eBay. So that person made the money, the builder made nothing. Yeah. And musical tastes, you know, change. And so, you know, you can expect these players to change instruments often when something better comes along that suits a particular song style or music style or something. And so that yeah. was that was a very discouraging, eye-awakening experience for this builder. What I generally do is I offer what's known as an artist discount. And that's usually about 20%. So that way the artist or the player has some skin in the game. They, uh, they know that, yeah. you know, hey, if they really want this guitar, they'll be willing to pay for it. And don't sell yourself, great advice. yourself short on that. Yeah, uh, great advice. You know, and I think the other thing you run into is what's really going to be the payoff for you? People going to see, you know, Taylor Swift was was coincidentally same last name, ta Big Taylor. But you see her playing Gibsons. You know, you still see her playing other guitars. Yeah. They, they move around and, yeah. and, and you have them for a while, then they change. And it's just, I don't yeah. know, it's. To me, it's for, for the low for the kind of yield that we're talking about. No, I, I I don't recommend it. I get emails all the time. Hey, I'm going to promote the heck out of this guitar. No, uh, -uh. it never works. <laughs> so give them an artist yeah. discount. If they're serious about it, they'll purchase it. Right. All right, uh, Gary, how do you price your guitars? Do you use a market average in comparison to your type and style of guitar? Well, I got a little story about that. When I was in Brazil in a, in another life, yeah, uh, I did a lot of language training at big corporations, multinational corporations, high-end executives. And there was a jean company, a guy that made jeans in Brazil. And his was the highest priced jean in Brazil. I mean, but they were the jean to have. I mean, if you were anybody at a club or something, you had to have those jeans. And so I asked him one time, I said, how do you price your jeans? He says, I do a market survey. I see what everybody else is charging and I double it. I said, wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's how he did it. What about you, Drew? Yeah, I, no, don't do that with your guitar. <laughs> it worked for him. <laughs> uh, that that's a that's a unique. Um, I would don't don't do that. Here's here's the the trick to pricing. First of all, understand what a price is. Mm -hmm. A price is a signal of value. Consumers have a shortcut. High price must be good. Low price must not be as good. But but what what people do is they look at their budget and they're going to buy what they think is the best guitar for the price point that they can afford. So they still use price as a signal of value. What what we're blessed with in the guitar industry, and and uh, is a fluid, 
a transparent pricing situation. Um, some industries are the price is not transparent or, or available. Just go to Guitar Center or Sam Ash or some, you know go to a site or Amazon, you know and um, and look at the prices for guitars. And what you'll see is that there's a, a wide price, a wide range. There's there's you know there's seventy five dollar guitars out there from yep. you know, yep. and then there's um, seventy five thousand dollar guitars. Well, where where do you live? And this goes again to the given the best guitar that you can build for your abilities. What is your comparable? Look at real estate. How is real estate priced? Comps, right? Yeah. Comps. And if you've got this house is the same as this model, but this has got a finished basement, then the price is a little higher. If this is, you know, the the leads a lot of work, they discount a little bit. That's all pricing is. It's a way to signal, hey, we think this is a little bit better because it's priced here. Right. One one quick um, trick, not trick, but you know, um, an approach is price your guitar exactly to the penny to the guitar out there in the market that you think best represents your work. Oh, and say, idea. I price my guitar exactly like a Taylor, you know, 6, 614, um, because it's got flame maple and, um, and it's, you know, got this bracing. And I, I think I, and, and that's one way to do it. Um, where do you fit on the curve? But may, set your prices and don't apologize. In other right. words, this is what I charge because I think it's worth this much. Don't try to set your prices based on the amount of time you put into it or the, the even the materials because unless it's you know very rare exotic materials. But people don't care about the materials per se or the amount of hours. They want value. They want to feel like they've got a great instrument and they paid a fair price for it. Right. Uh, yeah. I had uh, somebody once tell me that you should, they compared guitars to bottles of wine. They say, if you go to a restaurant, yeah. it's basically three prices. You have your entry level, your table wine. Yeah. You have kind of a middle of the road, and then you have that top shelf. And that top shelf is, boy, is it expensive. And very yeah. few people buy it. But right. when they do, they know the value. Yeah. The middle one, though, all of a sudden looks like a great bargain because that top yeah. one, boy, that's a, so, you know, shoot for that middle is what, what he was trying to say. And that, that so, actually worked pretty good for me. Yeah. And in the guitar course, marketing for luthiers, the pricing module has a lesson about what's called a tiered pricing approach. Yep. If I were you, what you do is you build three models. You have um, your middle of the road, you know, good guitar, really perfect in every respect. But then you're going to have like a high end model that you're you're going to make one of them, and it, you're going to charge twelve thousand for that guitar. And it's just you really don't want to sell it, but it's just out there as your baby, and it's got you know amazing things about it. You put it electronics in it, whatever you did, and then you have um, like a, a low end model that's just you know no binding, maybe you know really skinny down because it's the contrast between the three that you're trying to create in the customer's mind. Mm -hmm. um, and this gives the effect that Robbie's talking about this, this idea of tiered pricing, the very popular technique. Apple does it. Sears Roebuck does it. I mean, and, and it works. You're helping customers get a reference point about what, where the value is. Um, yeah. So create that Uber model, that super model. Yeah. Uh, don't price. put, yeah, don't, don't make your, beat up guitar you know your first guitar that low-end model frankenstein you know don't right. <laughs> that wouldn't do that well drew we got somebody here from north wales huh? isn't that amazing great uh we've already answered uh, the question how do you price your guitars do you use a market average comparison we just answered that one mo i have often wondered why many luthiers do not price their guitars for example when advertised on social media they comment direct contact for price why is this a strategy uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, Jay Litke, when I did the advanced uh, ukulele building course with him, when he started thinking about marketing and building his website, he, he started thinking about what he wanted to see. He said, for example, if I go to a website and I see something like, hey, contact for pricers, I immediately go to the next one. He says, this is what I want to see. I want to hear the instrument. I want to see it being played. And I want to know the price. That way I'm not wasting my time or the luthier's time. Yeah. What are your comments there, Drew? Yeah. The the uh, the conventional way to think about pricing is communicate the price once they understand the value. Okay. Um, so it's okay to wait on price until they've seen it, heard it, and go, "Wow, that's a good instrument." What's it? What's the price? 
that's the time to show it. But this idea of saying, you know, call for pricing, I think you, you, the mistake there is that um, people get suspicious. They get, they get icky. Like, what if I call and it's really out of my price range? Yeah. You know, and, and that's the thing to do. I would just say my, my guitars typically sell in the neighborhood of, you know, 3000 to 9000 depending on what you buy mm-hmm. and give people the range. And then they, okay, 3000 to 9000 there's, you know, maybe there's something in there that they'd really like if they insist on price right up front. Right. But again, don't apologize your 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 prices. You're doing your prices are a reflection of the value. Uh, now, but but if you the more you can delay the price until they understand and seeing the guitar, and and ideally like like Jay Lichty heard it and seen it played. I mean, yep. at that point, now that's the time to really let them know the price because the whole picture is there. Good, great advice. Um... Joseph is here from Portugal. Boa noite, Portugal. Uh, so, Mr. Noah Strickland, back on an earlier comment about pricing, that which we acquire too cheaply, we esteem too lightly. Boy, isn't that the truth. Francesco from Italy, how you doing? Uh, Larry there in Alabama again. Jeff Trogget, I think is how you pronounce it, and Michael Greenfield's guitars are at the very high end, twenty-five to 30,000 guitars. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I have turned down endorsement artists. I have been fortunate with a niche with film and media composers, not poor rock stars. Your audience may not, uh, may not, I think he went to say be the mainstream and boy, is that true? And I, I've often thought about this. I'm an artist. I'm making something for an artist, which is a musician. And generally artists don't have money. (laughs) So the, yeah. the the theory is flawed right from the beginning. I mean, the you know, I'm right. building a product for somebody who has no money. So I think uh, I think what uh, this person says is, you know, turn down endorsement deals and stuff like that. He's been fortunate with a niche in the film and the media composers because they tend to have a little bit more money. Yeah. Uh, Larry Atha, Greenfield talked about his pricing scheme in a relatively recent podcast of the Fretboard Journal. Oh, I missed that one. I might have to... Uh, we we'll have to look yeah, that yeah. one up. That's uh, that's interesting. And there's some great podcasts out there. Let me just give a plug to uh, Michael Baskin, a good yep. friend of mine up here in uh, Fort Collins. We've actually done a couple of video courses together, and he uh, he's put together a great podcast, going out and interviewing people, talking about everything you know, including pricing. So yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, let's see. Good guitars don't have good prices. <laughs> I guess you could say that. Um, it depends on what your definition of good is, right? Yeah. yeah it, it, um, good, good guitars should be priced to, to the market. I mean, priced to the market. That's, that's, um, and I get, I get my students say, well, you know, what, what should I do with salary negotiations? And I go price to the market. That's all you can expect. And, and if you get the market, you're doing pretty good. Same thing in the stock market. Yeah. Uh, same thing with guitars. You know, I talked about go to Guitar Center. I mean, just Taylor Guitars has a whole range from the low end 100, you know, GX 100s all the way up to their 900 builders models. And th- that that range of guitars really gives you an, an, an ideal ladder, pricing ladder to figure out where do you want to live in that. Um, I got to hear Greenfield and what he talks about. It's great guitars, you know, beautiful guitars. Yeah, that sounds um, like a great uh, podcast. Here is. Gonna go check strategy. that one out. Um, speaking of, of of markets, uh, there were, back when I was doing a lot of shows, there were basically three markets. There was the three to five thousand dollar range. There was the five yeah. to ten thousand dollar range, yeah. and then there was a ten and up range. Yeah. And back when the housing bubble hit, I was what two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Yeah. Um, the the five to ten market disappeared overnight. It just went away. And so now, and that's the market I was in at that time, the, the five to 10. So now I'm in the three to five range and, you know, that's getting pretty close to the high end guitar center guitars. So you really yeah. had to, to work the brand issue like uh, Drew's been talking about here. You know, uh, the, uh, yeah. the 10 and up stuck around for a while and then it kind of went away too. Looks like it's starting to come back. But yeah, those, those were the three markets and the comps that I would work with three to five, five to 10 and 10 and up. Yeah. And, and comps work not just with pricing. I mean, um, just go back to the real estate example. This house 
in this house are the same model built by the same builder, but this one has a finished basement, so it's worth more. Don't hesitate to compare your handmade guitars to a guitar center built model, you know, a, a Takamini or a, a Taylor or, you know, here, be able to show somebody, look at this and see what they do here. Now, what I try to do is this because I believe in that. In other words, go go head to head. You know, it's a it's you're you're basically able to look somebody in the eye and say, if you just want a over, you know, really heavily built guitar from a, a great brand, you know, Bob Taylor's a great guy and, and I, I you know love the company. I own a, some Taylors myself. But we we luthiers tend to build lighter guitars, less overbuilt, you know, a lot of a lot of hand craftsmanship in it, and it's it's special. You know, we're we're selling something that's special. Do you want just a Taylor guitar like everybody else has? You see it on TV all the time, or do right. you want something that's been handmade by this this person? Right. And that's what people are buying. That special experience. And again, don't apologize. Go head to head, um, and and uh, on, on the product and the price. Okay. Um, another question I, I got for you, Drew, is a lot of times you'll see luthiers they'll have like a base price on their on their website. Let's say five thousand dollars, just for the sake of conversation yeah. here. And, and then they have add-ons. Yeah. You know, so much for a cutaway, so much for an arm bevel, so much for an inlay. Yeah. So, and then you'll have other luthiers where you'll see price, all inclusive, whatever you want. Yeah. Is there a, a a plus or a minus or pro or con to either way, or does does it matter? Yeah. No, they're both viable uh, viable approaches. You know, look at look at cars today. Cars more and more, um, like the Lexus line of prestige cars you know you you get pretty much everything in in one package but porsche you get one step up to porsche it's a nightmare of the options that you can get yeah i mean just yeah. you can get you know if you want pink doorknobs you can get pink doorknobs and i just made that up but it's and then it's it's line item priced right and you is there an and, advantage to to you know that the initial sticker shock let's say uh, if you have like your base price, let's yeah. say it's five grand, people say, oh, yeah. that looks a lot better than 20 grand, but it includes everything. Yeah. So it, it kind of sucks right. them in and then you nickel and dime them right. or upsell them, right? Yeah. BMW is this way as well. They, they, you know, you start off and then you start adding stuff in and all of a sudden, whoa, you, you just shot really your budget into, real quick. Yeah. You're into an expensive guitar. That said, you know, you give somebody more flexibility, um, mm -hmm. in terms of, um, uh, being able to meet their budget. I, I'm not a big fan of, hey, if you get these kinds of frets, it's a surcharge of this, so da, 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 da. Right. You know, have have th kind of a low end, medium end, high end. And in those bundles, your best woods are at the top end, your, you know, your, and, and then use those features and those quality build aspects mm -hmm. Uh, maybe you know, maybe your best frets, your gold frets in the in the high end one, and, and a special treatment of the fret ends, or I don't know. You make this, you make these three models different, and and then sell them. So it's sort of a, it's it's kind of in between these two extremes. What Robbie's described. Here's one price. You, you pick what you want, and we're done. Or no, I'm going to line item you for every little thing you add. You want a rosette with an extra purfling? It's you know sixty bucks. Sorry. Right. right. I I just. I think there's a, a happier place in the middle somewhere. Right. Okay. Uh, Drew, I try and keep these uh, Shop Talk live streams, uh, you know, to, to around an hour or so. And we're coming up on okay. about 50 minutes here. So let me try and get a couple more questions here. And then I think I remember you said you had a trivia question or something for us. We're going to give away a free okay. course. All right. So, All right. Uh, Peter Burroughs uh, says, uh, for online promotion, what kinds of recordings do you think work best for sound demos? Videos, sound only, performance pieces, chord demos? Any thoughts on yeah. that? Um, and, and Peter, hi, nice, nice to meet you. I've, I've uh, <clears throat> heard about you and seen your 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 work, and um, I didn't have a chance to meet you. One day I'll have a chance to meet you. I understand you're out in the Robbie's neck of the woods, but um, you know, I what I think is is best. What I've seen that I I really enjoy is is a combination of both. But the the actual seeing a player chord it and strum it is the one that. Matt is, is 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 the allure you know it really has the allure uh so a video close up uh, focus on the hands not the, the face of the guitar player focus on the instrument and seeing it being strum and corded and uh it doesn't have to be long you know i, I mean really a 10 15 second clip uh and 
you're gonna you're gonna really bring up the value of that guitar. It's 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 ro romancing the stone, right? You're romancing the it's it is. Right. It's a romantic instrument from the start. It's a beautiful instrument, and so honor it with that romantic look and ah, the beauty of the sound coming from it. All right, Larry. Again, I think good guitars are bargains. I have a custom Martin Herringbone Dreadnought. It was expensive thirty years ago, five and a half thousand dollars, but it's given me hours of joy for three decades. I guess I should say hours of joy each week, and it's a great value, not a bargain. There you go. That's one way to look at it. Yeah, it, it really is. It's a lifetime in you know, the cost of ownership over a lifetime. Yep. You got a good, you got a good one there. Uh, yep. Nathan, I buy based on tone and feel. I've purchased lesser names. Yeah. Well, you're the perfect client. I've got some guitars behind me for sale. <laughs> no, Actually, a lot of a lot of people, especially Americans, uh, they put a lot of emphasis on the visual aspects of the instrument. And when I yeah. when I like to play an instrument, you know, I like to just close my eyes. I don't care about the appearance to begin with. That's not top priority for me. It is for a lot of people, though. So. Um, yeah, and you know, you just mentioned something about the feel. Um, I could see back to pricing and and. Imagine you had three or four different necks and you have people put those in their hand and they go, oh yeah, wow, that's the, that's the kind of neck I'm looking for. That really feels like the guitar I made with Robbie last week, it was a classical and had a, that D-shaped flat back. It really felt good in my hand. It was just great. As we know, that's so important how you hold the guitar. So if you did things like that for your potential buyers, you said, I'm going to build the neck shape to exactly your style mm -hmm. with hand scale length, you know, really made a big deal about that. Just that one story. Right. And, and it's a common strategy to say, look, if, if he's going to all that work to just get that right, God, imagine what the rest of the guitar must be like. Right. So, so sell that one magic secret sauce that you do extremely well that you're really proud of. Francesco over in Italy, I have a question which may sound silly. What is the average price for a luthier's work? For example, setup, refret, general repairs, and stuff like that. Well, what I would recommend, Francesco, is you yeah. do those comps that Drew was talking about. Find out what the market in your area charges, yeah. what it can bear. Um, these days, we have the internet, so you can dial up pricing on the internet. But at the same time, you know, price yourself according to what your brand, what you're trying to, to shoot for. For example, I have a pretty big reputation around the internet. And so I tend to charge a little bit more than what most people charge. And people send me guitars because they know that I'm going to be the one working on it. What do yeah. you think, Drew? Is that about right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, uh, the repair work can be more cost based. You know, if you're going to put, if you just sell, I'm going to have to put 70 hours in this because of the major work that, you know, I mean, then, then you you are right to uh, be a little bit more um, price based on your cost and effort. Right. Repair work is a whole different animal, um, and but it could be a valuable way to enhance your brand by the fact that you you know you know so much about guitar making, you also fix them. So right. I think there's some value to that. But anytime I go to pricing, I go to the market. What does the market tell me? Right. When where am I? Am I at the low end, it's okay to live at the low end. You can make a nice living at the at the bottom end of it. Yep. Uh, you don't have to be the premium player all the time. Just find find where you live based on what you think you offer. Here's another story. You know, when I first started doing repair work, that was not my main business. My main business was teaching, and so right. uh, I, I I figured out. Somebody once told me, figure out what your what your hourly rate is. What does it cost you to stay in business? And then what do you need to make? And so I figured out an hourly rate. And then anytime somebody would bring me an instrument, I would figure out how many hours it would take me to do that job. And I kept good records. And over time, I dialed that in. And now I'm pretty much spot on. But I based it on how long I think it'd take me to do the job. And I didn't do any comps whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to work for me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Francesco said it was silly, a silly question because he's in the field and he's curious. Well, that's fine. We're all you know in this together. What is the best best method to sell, dealer or website? That's from Mo over in the UK. Yeah, I I think you um, are going to be better off on your website uh, because the margins through a dealer are extremely high. You know, you're going to pay thirty to forty percent. Mm -hmm. But if you have a dealer like a, a unique guitar shop, like in Toronto, there's one. I think it's called the 12th fret or something like that. I, 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 and it's been a while since I've been there and it's a really unique, um, uh, stringed instrument. They have, they have violins and cellos and everything else. 
If you could strike a relationship and have your guitars sold in a shop like that, then then I I'd recommend it. It's it's good to have a few placements just to be able to say my mine are sold at these boutique stores. It enhances your brand, but the lion's share of your of your customers' research and everything else is going to be on your website. So so be prepared to sell online. You've got to have a store. You've right. got to be able to to transact. And, and whatever you do, whatever you sell it for online, if you sell it through dealers too, the price has to be the same. The experience has to be the same. You don't want to uh, undercut your dealer or, or overprice them. Um, so it's, it gets tricky as soon as you open up multiple channels. You have channel reconciliation that you have to keep in mind. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and get one more question here. And I, I'll tackle this one if you don't mind, Drew, and then maybe get sure. your input on it. Uh, the question is uh, – is selling guitars on eBay worth considering? And I've got a, a little example of that. I didn't do it for years. People told me, don't do it. You're going to cheapen your brand. And at that time, about the highest end uh, eBay guitars were going in, you know, 1800 to $2,000. And when I was teaching at the college, I always had a guitar that I would build along with my students. The school would pay for the materials. I was getting paid to teach the class. So basically, I had a free guitar at the end of every semester. Well, after several years of that, and after giving some away to that charity that I mentioned earlier, I thought, well, let me just try one on eBay. And I put no, uh, what's what's the, the name reserve. of it? No, no reserve. What? Yeah, no reserve. reserve. I put no reserve on it. It's, it's just see what happens. And I had a, I started selling guitars. And they were going at the high end of what eBay was selling, which is, you know, $2,000 and sometimes a little more. And I had a guy contact me one time. He says, hey, no, your, your guitars are going about what e eBay will bear. But the amount of repair work, the amount of questions, I even sold some guitars that were not listed on eBay. I mean, the, the advertising and the marketing, I mean, I couldn't have paid for that. So in that in that way, it was a fantastic thing. Now, I did have a negative experience. Well, I sold one of the guitars for 800 bucks. <laughs> that was a nice cutaway guitar with a beautiful hard shell case, shipping included. I mean, the whole nine yards, 800 bucks. And it came back on warranty work. <laughs> So I lost my shirt on that one, but the rest of them, I mean, it was it was great advertising. What do you think, Drew? Any comments on that? No, I, I think it's 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 worth trying out. Um, it's not my model because what I'm doing is completely different. But I wouldn't hesitate to sell on eBay. It's a viable market. Amazon, you're not going to be you know you're not, you're not going to be allowed to sell that kind of product on Amazon. So look at the reverbs and um, eBay's absolutely. But judiciously, you know, have maybe part of your strategy is you have a three-tiered approach, low, medium, high, right. and only your low end gets sold on eBay. Right. And 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 they can they can't buy your high end for that. They have to come to you, or they have to right. go to that that dealer that we talked about right. for that that twelve thousand dollar guitar, that yeah. marquee guitar, and then you sell everything else on your website. So a coherent, rational approach like that is, is is sending the right signals. And that's what marketing is, right? Yeah. Um, I made sure that when I did my eBay listings, I did a nice write-up about the college course I was giving. I did a nice yeah. write-up about me, and I included my website. Yeah. And that was great marketing right yeah. there. Even if you don't sell the instrument, people are going across your site yeah. and you know reading about that's, your bio and that yeah. kind of stuff. So, all right. Well, we probably should wrap this up. I mean, I'm a firm okay. believer that the, uh, the the speakers should always leave before the audience. <laughs> so if the audience <laughs> starts leaving before the speaker, something's wrong. So, uh, Drew, you had a little uh, trivia question. We're going to give away a, a, a course here. Yeah. So if you get this, the first person to get this trivia question correct. And how are we going to do that? We're going to put that in the, chat, in the chat box there? Put that in the chat. As soon as you hear the question, if you have the answer, put it in the chat. And okay. uh, Adriana will will – be monitoring that. We're just going to let the electronics and the speed of your fingers uh, determine this. All right. And this is for but, one uh, of Drew Boyd's uh, marketing for Luthier courses, which is what, about a $200 value. So it sells for about, yeah, 197 they sell yep. for. So yep. uh, it's a nice little, nice little uh, prize. A very good course. I'm very proud of it. Yep. All right. Here's the question. Ready? Let's do it. Very, very beginning of the course, I defined what marketing is in the most basic terms. What is marketing? All right. And the, the time is ticking here. Let's see who's going to come up with an answer. Basic terms. What is marketing? Huh? Most... Yeah, it's there's about a 15-second delay here, so that's okay. all right. It, it'll get out there. 
in the meantime, we should be playing some of that uh, da, 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 da music, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. right. The Dirty Knob says, making something important, that one thing you do well, and market that. That's it. That's it. All right. Now, I don't know who the Dirty Knobs is, but what I'm going to ask the Dirty Knobs to do is contact me, uh, 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 Robert at O'BrienGuitars.com. That's my email address. Uh, it's also on my website. Contact me, identify yourself, and I will uh, um, create an account for you on the website, and we'll make sure that you get a yeah. copy of the online course uh, that Drew did, Marketing for Lithium. Perfect answer. That's exactly what Make it important what you Perfect. do well. Well, he must have some really fast fingers because now all these other answers are coming in here. <laughs> Let's all right, see. good. Create a hype at your best ability. Figures I missed. Oh, so-and-so missed the start. Uh, this is what I do best. Selling yourself. A lot of good stuff in this course. I would recommend it. Enjoyed it. Very good. Thank you, Acoustic Coyote. Uh, communicating your product, pricing to customers. Well, I think they paid attention, yeah. Drew. Yeah, I, those all go together. But again, they're all in the service of raising the importance of what you do the best, the best of everything else you do. So. Fantastic. Hey, Robbie, thanks for having me. It was a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah, thank you, Drew, for, you for playing along here and, uh, you know, yeah. participating and sharing your expertise. And thank you for everybody that uh, dialed in here on this Sunday afternoon. That, yeah. Uh, it's very late in some parts of the world. If you like this type of content, and I've started doing more and more of this, if you like this type of content, make sure that you, you know, go to my uh, YouTube page with brianguitars.com, click on click subscribe. On Click on the bell icon. That way you get notified. Make sure you're on my newsletter, mailing list, uh, my Facebook page, all that kind of stuff. And I'll put this put this stuff out. Um, right. And we'll do more and more of it. So if you and also if you have any ideas about uh, future shop talks that you'd like to to hear, just go ahead and uh, send me an email. And I'll see what, see what we can do. All righty. Well, I think that's all about right. it. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. I'm going to see if I can push the right button here and. Uh, Cut our mic so that we're not talking in the background here. Let's see. We're, no, I don't want the intro. Let's see. I want the exit. There we go.